But let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter two. And uh, we've been talking about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit uh, going through uh, a format of discipleship and kind of uh, me trying to, in a large group, get into a small group context of how I would communicate the truth of uh, the Christian life. And we started uh, going through the elements of the Holy Spirit doctrinally and the epistles and what uh, Christ taught. But what I thought for the next two or three weeks, I would like to illustrate what these doctrines look like in a person. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is a spirit. He's invisible. How do you illustrate someone that's invisible? You show the effects of the invisible spirit that we can see in their life. And that's what we're gonna see over the, the next few weeks. The Holy Spirit, in normal people, what he does. And so what I've entitled this is Simeon, and that's Luke 2, if you wanna get there, and we're gonna start in verse 25. Simeon is a living illustration that you can look at and, and imagine and think about because there are enough details that you can actually see this scene going on. He is a living, full color, living and breathing illustration of what a spirit-filled life looks like that God offers to us. Now, again, I mentioned, uh, I think uh, last week, and I know, well, two weeks ago, but last Sunday night in the Q&A time, I said that in the Old Covenant, the Holy Spirit only came upon, now he regenerated anyone that was saved, but he only came upon and empowered certain individuals. Most of them we know about, because the ones that were empowered, they burst into the pages of the scripture. But the rank and file normal people did not have what we have this morning. All of us have resident within us, if we're born again, the same spirit that energized Simeon, Paul, and Christ himself. The same spirit waiting every day to energize us, to fill us, to lead, to empower, to use. And, and that working that he wants to do is illustrated in Simeon's life. So, we're looking one by one at spiritual living lessons that new believers need to have personally taught to them by older believers. That's what discipleship is. And we've looked at, we're in the third. First is saved. Now, I've repeated this, but I'll repeat it again. The reason I call saved the first lesson is, and that's why I went all the way through the book of Acts with you and looked at the salvation lessons, is over the last three and a half decades that I've discipled people, I have numerous times had people sign up to be discipled. I've met with them, gotten all alone with them, started talking to them. The longer we talked, we both realized that they were trying to live the Christian life and they weren't even plugged into the outlet. It's kind of like, think of any appliance you have. You know, your toaster, you can put the bread in and out and pop it up and down. It doesn't toast if it's not plugged in, right? I mean, that's a simple illustration. I see a lot of Christians, they, they, they're trying to do the Christian life and they're popping in and out, but the toaster's not working. And when you sit with them, you say, well, when did you get plugged in? And they go, I didn't even know I had a plug. What? See, they're not saved. And I, I have had the privilege of leading people to the Lord in lesson one of discipleship because the first part of this whole process is you have to be saved. You have to be supernaturally. It's not how hard I try and I'm gonna try a little harder next week. It's whether or not you have been born from above, whether or not I have living within me God himself. There's only two kinds of people in the world, those that have the son and those that don't. Uh, and those that don't, there's some that wish and some that hope and some that trying their hardest, but they don't have the son. Save people have the Son, and they have life. Secondly, the evidence of salvation is Scripture-fed, that, that like newborn babes, we desire. We have an internal hunger. I mean, a, a baby either is crying and screaming or it's got the bottle. It's either being fed or it's sleeping or it's being changed. You know, I have a lot of experience in this. <laughs> Remember my, I can't tell stories anymore. I've gotten so old. I told about how I used to put the, you know, the, uh, I don't forget, the baby powder, you know, the big white, big tall thing, and poof, you know, in a big cloud of smoke, and I had parents in the lobby go, mm, bad for their lungs. <laughs> I said, how did anybody grow up? You know, we, everything's bad nowadays, and I love baby powder. But, you know, uh, what I learned from babies is either change them, sleep them, or feed them when they're little. If they're not hungry, they're sick. If a person isn't scripture fed, they're sick, or they're not saved. See, if they're, the Bible says as newborn babes desire the sincere milk, and James says you receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. 
Thirdly, that's where we get. Then the plug, the power starts showing up. The, the power of the spiritual life is the Spirit of God filling us. That means that we're, he's flowing through us. He's energizing. Everything that we read about in the Bible only works if he prompts and energizes and empowers it to work. And, and the greatest thing in life is seeing everything God designed. It's kind of like uh, I get this magazine from uh, England. Uh, it's called, I think it's called Mac Format. I think that's what it's called, something along that lines. It'll have 122 things you never knew you know, you can do with this or that. I mean, I love getting a cup of coffee, getting a magazine, getting my whatever the article's about, iPad, iPhone, or, you know, I whatever, and I sit there, and I look at it, and I, I do all the little things. It works. I know, I know if I follow the instructions, this works. Did you know everything in here works if you're connected to the Spirit of God? And what we have to do is we have to learn to allow him to do these things in our life. And that's why Luke, and, and I, let's go to chapter one, verse 15. I'm gonna walk with you. And what I'm gonna show you is the Holy Spirit is revealed in many ways in God's word. 80 times in the Old Testament, in fact, after first service, someone came up and they asked me how they could start studying the Bible. And I said, well, why don't you just Look these things up. I'm only touching on them. I said, why don't you start by looking at everything the Holy Spirit does in the book of Luke. And I said, when you get done with that, look at all the 12 times Jesus prays and what he prayed for in the book of Luke. And uh, just things like that. This, this, what I'm doing right now with an individual that I'm discipling, I, I'm not trying to give them a seminary education. I'm trying to get them started seeing the process of how you grow. And so the book of Luke shows us the amazing Holy Spirit at work. And here, I'll give you the references for it. I, I wrote them all down for you. This is a typical pneumatology, pneuma spirit. Ologia or logia is the study of. So the study of the Holy Spirit is a pneumatology. So I read the book of Luke and I marked each time I could find the Holy Spirit at work and, and just examined what it was he was doing and then tied it to what the epistles, like Paul's epistles and Peter's epistles and what James said, I tied it. And so I did an entire study of the Holy Spirit at work and, and so I sit with them in a, in a, in not to reproduce seminary, but to get them stirred. And I usually wait until one of the passages that we cover, you can almost see it when you're working with someone. They go, whoa, I didn't know it said that in the Bible. Say that again, how does it work? So let me show you what I mean. Verse 15 of chapter one. It was the Holy Spirit that Gabriel announced would fill John the Baptist as he prepared the way for Christ's coming. So John the Baptist, an Old Testament prophet, was filled with the Spirit to do his ministry. And so that's interesting. Uh, go to verse 35. It was the Holy Spirit who caused Christ's conception in Mary. Now think about that. The Holy Spirit communicates or is the actually is the conduit through which all the things that God does happens. God the Father is, is overall, as 1 Corinthians 15 says, until Christ delivers all things back to the Father who is overall. God the Son is the agent through which God has revealed himself as the, the visible representation of God is, is Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one that does everything. And part of his doing everything is he doesn't want us to be paying attention to him. He wants us to look at Christ, but he's the one that does everything. You notice, as we go through this list, Jesus doesn't do all this stuff. He does it in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the more we understand that the Holy Spirit doesn't want to speak of himself, and doesn't want to glorify himself, and that's kind of a little problem we have in Christendom nowadays. People are fanfaring the Spirit when the Holy Spirit says, I don't talk about myself, I point you to Christ. And if the Holy Spirit is working, it's pointing everyone toward Christ for what he accomplished. Well, the Holy Spirit caused Christ's conception, right there in verse 35. Now look at verse 41. It was the Holy Spirit that prompted Elizabeth. I mean, look what it says, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. It was the Holy Spirit that revealed to Elizabeth that Mary was bearing, bearing within her God the Son, the Christ. 
and he revealed that and, and uh, that's when we have this uh, verse 42 onward, one of the five songs of Christmas that, are, that Luke records, the, the exclam of it, it's called, blessed are thou among women, all that. Keep going to verse 67. Same chapter, the Holy Spirit's really busy in verse one, or chapter one. Now, the, his father, Zacharias, was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied. By the way, this is a first spirit-filled family in the New Testament, and it's uh, Zacharias, Elizabeth, and John the Baptist, and, and all three of them are filled with the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating. It's the only completely spirit-filled family we ever have chronicled in the Bible, and, and we'll come to them uh, another week. But it was the Holy Spirit that spoke through Zechariah, announcing that God's son, uh, Christ, uh, was going to be heralded by their son, John the Baptist. Uh, keep going to chapter two, that's where we're gonna be this morning, and I love verse 25 onward. It was the Holy Spirit that led Simeon to find Jesus, a six-week-old Jesus being carried by his parents. The Holy Spirit led Simeon to find him, and, and we'll cover that in detail. Uh, look at chapter three. Uh, the Holy Spirit is at work in verse 16. John answered and said, I indeed baptize you with water, but there's one mightier than I who's coming, whose sandal strap I'm not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And, and that's parallel to the fact of what Paul later says, that it's the Holy Spirit that baptizes every one of us the instant of our salvation into the body of Christ. It's, it's very fascinating. Our water baptism behind you know, that screen there in the baptistry is only an outward act reflecting what the Holy Spirit has already done inside of us, that we're baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. Uh, as 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, uh, it's the Holy Spirit in verse 22, if you look down a little further, and the Holy Spirit descended bodily like a dove and came on Christ and, and Jesus uh, being filled with the Spirit in verse one of chapter four was led out to be tempted. It's the Holy Spirit that, that led Christ out into his desert temptation. Uh, it's the Holy Spirit, look at chapter four, verse 14. This is fascinating and usually they pause for this. I mean, this, this one usually is... Uh, when, when they go, wait a minute, what did you just say? When we're marking this in our Bibles. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee and news of him, and verse 15, he taught. Did you catch what that says? How did Jesus go all over the place and teach? In his own strength? No. It's clearly portrayed that Christ's ministry was accomplished not by him independently, but he always did the will of the Father, and the will of the Father is that Jesus Christ would serve in the power of the Spirit. And by the way, that's the will of the Father for us too. And everything Jesus did, he didn't do on his own. In fact, what did Jesus say about us? He looked at his disciples, he said, greater things you're gonna do than I did. And we go, huh? That's because Jesus fulfilled God's will for him. God the Father's will for God the Son, Jesus Christ. We are supposed to accomplish God's will for us. You see, there's something each of us were designed, equipped, and called to do that only we can do, and someday we're gonna stand in front of the Father and the Son and the Spirit. The Son will say, I bought them, and the Spirit says, I waited within them to accomplish all your will, O Father, and God's gonna look at us and say, hmm, and did you do what I designed you to do? Did you allow my spirit to work through you? Or did you spend your life, you know, collecting widgets that are all still burning up on earth right now? Or did you do what I called you to do? Usually that's where they start squirming in their seats. That's what, the, see the power of discipleship? You start talking about this and you look up at the person you're discipling and saying, do you know what you were designed to do? You know, I have a snowblower, I can't wait till we, get snow that stays so I can use it, you know? Um, I love my snowblower. But I had to move it the other day and I asked the boys to move it because, you know, that's what you have boys for. And that thing must weigh hundreds of pounds. And it's a two-stage and it's this massive thing. And if the motor's not running, it is so hard to move. It was not designed to operate without the motor running. Even the little tires seem to resist. And, and even when I hold the unresistor things, they still resist, you know? They're kind of like people, you know, resistant. And, and what I thought about is, a lot of people go through their Christian life 
not, that snowblower, I can jam it into every snow bank possible, but if the motor's not running, it doesn't do what it was designed to do. During the big snow, I don't know which one, we've had two that have disappeared on us, but I was happily, I had my big um, earmuffs on and all my snowblowing stuff, and I was going, and I love to get it angled so it just blows over in my neighbor's yard. I love doing that. And I've got it, you know, I look at the trajectory and do the trigonometry, it's just a grape vine. I mean, it doesn't, heat. I'm watering his grapes. But I'm just going along, and I kept hearing this loud sound, louder and louder. I thought, we're snowed in here. It took me three hours to snow blow the driveway. I thought, who is honking? And I turned around, there's a gigantic UPS truck and he's right, right there. Beep, 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 beep. And I had to go into the snowbank to get out of his way. And I thought, that snowblower, if the motor wasn't on, could never make the way for the UPS truck. It was designed to do that, but only if the motor's running. Are you doing what you were designed to do. And that's what discipleship's all about. And I could go on and on, but I won't. Uh, keep going to uh, chapter 10, verse 20. It's the Holy Spirit in chapter 10, verse 20. And we're just doing a pneumatology uh, study of the Spirit. In 1020, it says, nevertheless, don't rejoice that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. And by the way, when you look at the parallel passage to that, which uh, is in Romans 8, 9, who's the one that writes us in heaven? It's the Holy Spirit. And Jesus goes on to say, look at verse 21, and Jesus rejoiced in the spirit and said, I thank you. And do you know what gave Christ the joy and rejoicing? Remember, he's described in Matthew as being a, a man acquainted with sorrows. He's meek and lowly in heart. Remember that? He, Jesus was kind of a, a, a melancholic, at least in Matthew eleven twenty-eight 28 to 30, describing him. But what made him so full of joy? Look at verse 21. The Spirit of God prompted him to joy. And we could go all the way through this, but go to the end with me, chapter 24. There are others, but uh, I want to get into Simeon's life. But look at 2449. And, and what I love about this last one is, uh, this is fascinating. The Holy Spirit is called the promise of the Father. You know, God the Father has promised us everything that Christ accomplished but he promised that only comes through the conduit of the Spirit of God. And that's, what, that's why we study the Holy Spirit. So basically what we're doing this morning is we're gonna look at how the Spirit works in normal people. Did you know America is primarily made up of normal people? Someone was talking about the fact that, that we spend so much time looking at, there's some sports person that just got paid, I don't know, $300 million contract. I don't even know what sport, but I, I wonder if they're gonna get, how much they're gonna charge in tickets. I wonder how many years this guy's gonna have to earn that back. But whoever it is, I'm glad he's making it. But we look at these abnormal people. It's abnormal to be paid $300 million to play a sport. That's abnormal. When normal people, you know, work their tails off for $9 or $9.50 or $7.50 or whatever, you know, is the going rate. Did you know that the world is basically 99% normal people? You know, the normal people that plow and deliver and, you know, the tanker trucks and the milk truck and, you know, the person that picks up the garbage can. And if those normal people didn't do their work, the extraordinary people wouldn't have any, they don't even know what to do other than their little specialty, you know. And that's amazing, and that's how it is in the church. You know, we know about the superstars, but the vast majority of everything God does in the world is through normal people that allow the Spirit of God to work through them. And Simeon is one of them. Look, look at the text, and we're gonna read the whole thing in just a minute. But as we look at Simeon, he's introduced starting in, in uh, verse 25, and if it wasn't for this introduction, he would be like the untold billions of others through human history that were only known by those closest to them during their life, and they died without leaving a trace. Most people have ever lived, we don't even know their name. We know Simeon's name, but that's all we know about him, other than the fact of what we're gonna see that Simeon was a spirit-filled believer. And that's what catapults him above the people of his day. Simeon was chosen because Simeon had the spirit of God at work within him. 
Did you know that's what God wants to do with all of us? Simeon sends a message from his life that extends far from the Christmas scene and it reaches all the way to the very end of each of our lives. Simeon was a spirit-filled, spirit-led servant and he's a model. And what's happening here? Jesus is a little six-week-old baby being brought into the temple and God wanted someone to intersect that couple coming in and he wanted to use Simeon to meet Joseph, Mary, and baby Jesus and to deliver a blessing. And God says, that's my will. And there's Simeon. And Simeon wants to do what I want him to do, so I'm gonna use him. See, that's what's so exciting about life. Just checking in with the Lord and saying, I want to do, I want to be, I want to say, I want to go where you, God, have designed for me to go. Well, let's read this amazing record. It's starting in verse 20. Actually, I'm gonna start in verse 25. So you got it? Okay, I'm, I'm at the coffee shop. Do you have it? Okay, a few of you are at the coffee shop with me. Let's all stand. Now we'll see if you're here. We don't do this at the coffee shop, but you stand, and I'm gonna read in Luke 2, well, I'm still in 24, starting verse 25, all the way down uh, through verse 35. Here we go, 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms and blessed God and said, verse 29, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Verse 35, yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Wow. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you'd open this passage to us. Thank you for giving it to us. Thank you for the privilege of having you, O Spirit of God, who illumines, you, O Spirit of God, who inspired this very word. You are the one that can open it to us so that we can be even more looking like Christ. That's your goal, to make us point at Christ and reflect Christ. And that's, that is what you wish to do more and more in every one of our lives. And I pray that we would have open faces, as Paul called it, beholding in this glass of the word of God your glory and that we would be changed into Christ's image more today as we surrender to your work, O Spirit. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, what I want you to see is simply, and there's two kinds. Did you know there's two kinds of ways of teaching the Bible? There's eisegetical teaching and exegetical teaching. Eisegetical teaching uh, is you already have an idea, and then you search the Bible to find some verses to support it. That's reading into the Bible your ideas. Exegetical teaching is where you find the ideas, and exegeto means you bring them up out of the Bible and you present them. So look at this text and tell me what, what is God trying to get our attention? about. And basically, Simeon's life is only chronicled here. This is the only time we know about him. And what is it that God chooses to point out about his life? Well, verse 25. Look at the very last uh, one, two, three, four, five, six words of verse 25. The Holy Spirit was upon him. So that's, that's pretty clear. Look at verse 26. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit. This, I mean, this is, this is starting to get clear. And verse 27, so he came by the Spirit. 
Do you see how in such close proximity, this man that we know nothing about is all about the working of the Spirit of God inside of him. Walking in the Spirit ensured for Simeon a life that mattered. We don't know anything else about him. He could have come and gone and and without a, a marker on a gravestone. But what jumps off the page that records in his life is he had a life that counted because he walked in the spirit. That's, that's what, what, what it means to walk in the spirit. It means to be on duty. I mean, have you ever gone to a store and you have this new generation of people that act like it's a bother that you came in and they have to stop talking to each other and texting each other. They have to actually come over and do something. You know, it's kind of a new generation. It used to be you were mobbed. You know, when I grew up, you went into a store, you were mobbed. Now you have to stir up someone to work, you know, and say, excuse me, do you work here? And they go, why? You know, you say, because I always like to buy something. Okay. You know, and they put away their phone. And, and, but, but the old way was you were taught to be on duty. And if someone came in the door, you go, hello, hey, can I help you? You know, do you need some shoes, you know, or whatever you're selling? Simeon was on duty. See, that's what it means to be having the spirit of God. It means you check in for work and you're on duty, knowing who you work for, wanting to please him and saying, what do you want me to do in life? Well, God doesn't force this. God wants to work through us, but he doesn't force it upon us. In fact, someone in first service was showing me they had made a quilt for someone in the church, and it it was real pretty, it had two hearts, but between it, there was a, a little strand, and it had two doves. And what it was showing is the Holy Spirit knitting hearts together, I think, was the picture. Why is the Holy Spirit portrayed as a dove? because he's not a bully. Have you ever seen a dove come up and say, move out of the way, you know? That is not, I mean, when you have peace talks, they show an, a dove with olive branches. It's, it's, a dove is peaceful, not belligerent, not pushy, not forceful. How is the Holy Spirit described in the New Testament? Well, we're supposed to walk in the Spirit and wait for the Spirit and present ourselves and clothe ourselves and yield ourselves and surrender Do you you see the flavor of how the Holy Spirit works? He invites us to yield to him. See, that's that's the essence of the spirit-filled life. Life as God intended it be for every believer is pictured by this simple, humble, obscure man. As we study his life, we need to ask ourselves, am I offering myself to the Lord to live like him? I mean, he only did what he did because the Spirit prompted him. I and you should want to live a life that would only work. And people would say, the only way I can figure that they did what they did is the Holy Spirit prompted him to do it. Okay, let's go through the points of his life. Number one, first, look at verse 25. Like Simeon, seek the spirit-filled life God offers. And it says, behold, there's this man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and that, I mean, Anna, we know her husband and her tribe and how old she was. This guy, we know nothing, just his name. And this man was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Let me ask you a question. Now, now we're back in the coffee shop. And this is where the, when you're discipling someone, they can tell. You look at him and say, how, do, how would you get the Holy Spirit on you like that? How, how did Simeon, how do you think that happened? Did the Lord knock him off his horse like Paul? How did Simeon get filled with the Spirit? And then you look at him and say, did you know that the Bible explains this? In 600 years before Simeon, God told everyone how they could have him filling their life? Take a moment, now just stay your finger in Luke, but go back to Jeremiah with me, 29. And, and if you don't know where Jeremiah is, go to the middle Psalms, go to the right. In, in my Bible, it's 210 pages back um, from um, Luke. But Jeremiah 29. So Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, go to the right, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then to the 29th chapter of Jeremiah. Now, what I want you to see here is, how does anyone get God to enter their life? God said long before Simeon's day, in Jeremiah 29 and verse 13, in fact, 600 years before Christ's birth, God explains how you get his attention. 
okay? And this is how we get the Spirit of God upon us. This is the secret, Jeremiah 29, 13. And you will seek me, and you will find me. What does it say? When you search for me, what? With all your heart. Thank you. You just said it. And I have them say it. In fact, I ask people, the key parts, I have them repeat. I say, say that again. With all your what? With all your heart. And then I pause and, and I ask them some questions. Now, building up to this, it means that Simeon had sought God. Simeon had opened his life to God. Simeon had surrendered to God's control. Simeon wanted God's way. He wanted God's control. And when you want God's control, God controls us through his spirit. But he doesn't force himself. He waits for an invitation. And when we invite him in, when we, Jeremiah 29, 13, when we seek him and find him with all of our heart, when we say, God, I want what you have promised. In fact, one of the passages we didn't look at in Luke that is a wonderful passage says that God, if a parent will give stuff to their children, how much more will God give the Holy Spirit to anybody that asks him? It's not like the Lord's holding out for you to ask hard enough, long enough, you know. If, if we just desire him with all of our, you ever talk to someone you tell you don't quite have all their attention? They're going, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, they're doing something else, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or you can hear the keyboard in the background while you're, you know, they're still typing away or whatever they're doing. God says, I want you to stop everything and completely focus on me and want me with all your heart. Now this is when, and let's go back to Luke 2.25 because this is when I pause. And do you see why Paul told Titus while he was being a missionary on the island of Crete? He said, the only way you're gonna transform these newcomers to the faith in Christ is to send out a legion of a little bit older in the faith, men and women, to sit face to face with them. See, discipleship is best accomplished face to face. And you start looking at people and you ask them questions, okay? This is a typical question that I would ask to my person, whoever it is I'm meeting with. I smile at them, I say, could I ask you a question? Of course, there's only two of us. What would they say? Oh, sure. I say, how long has it been since you asked God to take over the plans of your life? Like, all your plans, your financial plans. Have you asked God to take that over? How about your education plans? How about your relational plans, you know, your dating life? Uh, how about your career? You know, the law. How long has it been since you ask God to take over your plans and you spread them out before the Lord? There's this beautiful picture of Hezekiah uh, that, that is uh, both in Chronicles and in Isaiah. And it's a picture of Isaiah had a, uh, I mean, uh, Hezekiah had a quandary and he took the, the letter that was troubling him and he spread it out in front of the Lord. He said, I don't know what to do. How long has it been since you spread out your life's plan to the Lord and said, is this what you want? Are these my plans or yours? I don't want my plans. And then you just pause and you go, I think, oh, am I supposed to answer? You go, mm -hmm. And they said, I don't even know what that means. How, how do you do that? Well, then you explain it. You say, this is the, the perfect example. Now, do you remember, Jesus thrilled the common people because he talked about things they all could picture. He talked about sowers and seeds. They all had grown up walking around and having someone throwing seeds and some of it fell in front of them. And they could just, they saw that. And the lilies of the field and fishermen and, and everything, you know. You have to bring the, the first century or before stuff down to where they can see it in life. So what's a typical example of surrender in our culture? How about this? How long since you parked the car of your life? In other words, we're driving through life going wherever we want and we pull over, turn it off, 
pull out the keys, get out of the car, and surrender the keys, the steering wheel, and the driver's seat to God. Now there is a concrete picture of what Jeremiah 29, 13 is talking about. So, so you, you look at them, remember this is a question. When was the last time you stopped everything in life, parked, turned everything off, said, God, I don't want to go another foot in life in the driver's seat. This is consecration. This is surrender. This is dedication. But what's so interesting is life gets going so fast that we run out of the door and jump in the car and take off and the Lord is riding either in the trunk, the back seat, maybe in the front seat, you know, depends on how important he was to us that day. And we're just buzzing off and all of a sudden we go, oh, sorry. And we have to consciously, see this is, this usually is accomplished in our devotional times. After the Lord, after we pray and he starts opening the word to us and we are, we're reading and we read long enough that all of a sudden we say, oh Lord, how much of the last day or two or week or month have I just worked on my own? It doesn't stop there. I mean, here's a couple more questions because you have to keep talking until they can connect. How long has it been since you were personally aware of his presence in your heart and life each day? That, that you were aware... It's kind of like when you invite the Lord into your life, it isn't like you have to follow him around all day long looking for him. If you invite the Lord into your life, you can still be a a warrior like David or a a farmer like most of the Israelites were in in their ancient lives and David is a shepherd. You don't have to just sit there and say, oh Lord, I don't wanna stop thinking about you. He interrupts our day with his presence. How long has it been since you were personally aware of his presence in your heart and life each day? I mean, I was a corporate salesman. I worked for American Home, Wyeth, and Ayers, and all the drug companies, and traveled crisscross the country and flew, and you know, just that whole fast lifestyle with sales managers on your back and vice presidents, and, and it's like they never give you a free moment. Did you know that the, the Lord can, it's almost like you're coming around the corner in your house and you bump into, well, that happens to me. Anytime I'm home, I get so distracted. I come around the corner and there's Bonnie. I'm immediately distracted when I see Bonnie. You know what I mean? It's just immediate. And, and you know what? It's because I love her. And, and I think sometimes she knows that I'm so busy that she just kind of steps out. So I, you know, bump into her. And, and it just, the Lord wants to intercept us all through life. And it's not like you have to sit at your cubicle and think, I'm trying not to think about General Motors today. I'm trying to think about the Lord. No, think about General Motors. Is that still a company? I don't know. You know, (laughs) went bankrupt a while back. But you know what I mean. Just do your job and invite the Lord in at the beginning and you will bump into him all day long. You will become aware of his presence in your heart and life. He'll remind you spontaneously of a scripture that you already read or you already learned and it will flow. How long has it been since you cried out and told the Lord you want to rely on him? to lead and guide you. It, see, I'm, it, these are all saying the same thing. What we're asking is we're inviting the Lord in. Okay, now go to verse 26, and I won't take so long on all these verses. Some of you are getting nervous, like the guy that fell asleep in first service. Um, uh, and if you see someone, tell him he's getting to a good part, you know, and uh, wake him up. But look at verse 26. And it was revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before the Lord, before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Next, like Simeon, seek, now look at the the title there on the screen, the spirit illumined life. Do you know what? And I think I'm covering it tonight. Um, Last week we had so many questions. We had a run on the microphones that I, all I did the whole night is write the questions down. Barely answered any of them. So I'm sorting back through and gonna come back to them tonight. And I think one of them was something about how do you know the Lord's will? And what I said is, that's probably the most frequent question I get. People are saying, how do I know it's Lord's will that I take that job, that I marry that person, that I even do this, that I I have two choices, how do I know the Lord's will? Did you know that the Lord has told us exactly how to know his will? Did you know that? Do you know what verse? If, If you're sitting, discipling someone and they ask you that, where do you turn? Well, let me show you. It's back to the middle to Psalm 16 and verse 11. Because God has told us exactly how to know his will. And it might surprise you what he said. You, most of you already know that verse, but think about what it's saying. Psalm 16 and verse 11. 
Simeon learned what God wanted him to do in life. How did he learn it? How was he confident that God had a plan? And how could he rest in that plan? That calm assurance came from what Simeon had learned as a good, temple-going, observant Jew. Because he regularly heard this 16th Psalm. And look what it says in verse 11. This is how you know the Lord's will. He shows it to us. Isn't that amazing? Have you ever thought about that? People are out searching. I mean, it's like they've got spotlights and they're going, I want to know the Lord's will. And the Lord's standing there and saying, verse 11, I will show you the path of life. My will only comes by me leading you into it. If you stay behind me, if you follow me, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they what me? Follow. God's will. Now I know that, you know, it's, it, what we want to know is between this car and that car, and what we want to know is between this person and that person. But all of that is answered the same way. God says, I want to show you the path of life. You know you're following me because you'll have fullness of joy as long as you stay in my presence. The way we stay in the Lord's presence is staying right with him. Now, I'm terrible on this. When, when we're following someone, I'll get talking to Bonnie and I'll get talking to the kids and I'll get thinking. And I just, Bonnie will say, you're, you're passing them, honey. Oh, I'm sorry, honey. Back up, slow down, stay behind them. They're, they're leading us somewhere. That happens to us regularly in life. We'll, we just get going in life and pretty soon we're not following the Lord. In fact, after first service, someone met me in the aisle and they said, we have been doing what you said this morning for years. And the Lord hasn't shown us the next step. I said, then his will is what you're doing right now. You should have seen the look on their faces. They said, waiting is God's will? I said, yep. Did you know that there are eight different Hebrew words? The English word, if you take a concordance, that's a big book like Strong's or Young's, and look up the English word, wait. Underneath the English word, they'll have Hebrew word, Hebrew word, Hebrew word, Hebrew word, Hebrew word, and then all the verses that are translated. But what you find is there are eight different Hebrew words that are all translated by one English word, wait. You know what that means? God has a lot of waiting for us. And his will is that we wait. In fact, the, the three ways God answers, yes, no, and wait, in my life, the most, I get the wait one. And I don't like that one. I like yes or no. Do it or don't. And it's wait. And that's because he said, you all know this, Isaiah 40, 22, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. You see, God has so much and he wants to, verse 11, Psalm 16, show us the path. Do you have the calm assurance that you're following the plan of God? If not, it means that, that you're passing the Lord. He says, wait and follow me. Okay, back to Luke 2. And let's keep going. So that's the spirit-filled life we saw, and you park the car and let him in. And the spirit-illumined life, you follow him. Here's the next one. I love this. The Spirit-led life. Now in Luke 2.27, look, look what it says. And he came by the Spirit into the temple. Now I'm not going to have you look this up. But first I want to show you the daunting task. I don't get to do this very often. I mean, I could talk about the Holy Land night and day. I, uh, in fact, I was meeting yesterday. I shouldn't tell you this, but I was meeting yesterday. My sister's a missionary of New Tribes, and they were driving through, and I saw them at Cracker Barrel for about an hour and a half. And you know what they told me? They're these geneticists, I mean, uh, genealogists. They're always looking back. I think we're related to Noah or something they found out, and you are too. But I mean, they're looking in between. And you know what they said? They said, we found out that, that on Mama's side in Czechoslovakia, they're all Jewish. And I said, ah, oh, that explains it. I've always loved Jerusalem. I think I'm Jewish. I doubt it. But I think I am. Uh, you know, but, so I love the Holy Land. Do you know what this is? This is Herod's temple. This platform is 40 acres. Uh, the Dome of the Rock is right there now, but it used to be the Holy of Holies right here. Now, there are two words for this structure in the New Testament. The first word is the word naos, and it speaks of the Holy of Holies. 
The other word is hi'aran. Uh, actually, it doesn't have an H, but it has an H sound. And that speaks of the whole square, the whole precinct. This is the word that is used in verse 27. And what, what it was is, this is 40 acres at some of the feasts, and by the way, it has all kinds of intricacies. Only the, the uh, Levitical workers could be in here. The men could be inside of this square. Uh, the women could be inside of this wider square right there. And the Gentiles could be in the periphery all the way around. And so uh, at the high point of the feast, you could have 100, 150,000 people or more packed into this. Normally tens of thousands. And Simeon is gonna find one couple. They all kind of look, they all dressed alike, you know, robes, men and women, you know. And they're holding a baby and everybody had to come and go with their babies uh, for all the ceremonies. And, and most of the people came up this set of stairs, the southern steps here, and came in the double and came out the triple and all that. But how would they find the, how would he find the right ones? Well, look, look back at what it says. The spirit led life. How would you find someone here? The same way we would find someone today or find anything the Lord wants us to do. You all know this verse, Psalm 119, 105. Do you know what it says? Thy word is a what? Yeah, a light to my path and a lamp unto my feet. What is that? It's talking about walking in the dark. That's what most of life is like. We're walking in the dark. We don't know where we want to go. And the, the Israelites would have these little plates and they had an oil lamp and they had a, usually two or three cords or chains or strings and they would hold it and it would hang down and they would walk along like this. And that light, see, immediately this communicated. In, there were no street lights, but there were scorpions and vipers and everything else and sharp stones and, and drop-offs. They didn't have guardrails back then. And so people that went out at night had this little lamp that threw a circle on their path and showed them where to put their feet. And that's all they got. They didn't have, you know, halogen, you know, argon lights, you know, uh, low green lights, you know, that are in the parking lot. They just knew the next step, they could see the path, the next step, they could see the path, the next step. That, that's what the spirit-led life is like. Most of us want a triptych. We want to go to AAA and we want the whole thing all the way to the destination. We want to know and we're going to look at it and decide if we really like it. God says, huh? I want you needing me so much that my word that you're into every day. Did you know when we're not in the word, we're walking in the dark down the path and, and people are tripping and falling off the edge and getting bit by everything. God wants us to have the spirit-led life. And what that does is, look at verse 28, and I'll just finish this up. This is so good. Uh, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God. This is Simeon and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace. Wow, there's so much right there. He called himself God's servant and he, he considered his life on earth ending with what he called departing and he said, I would be peaceful and if I had the time and I usually take a little time on this, I do a word study with the people from this verse, the word depart in your Bible. The word depart is used all the way through the New Testament in three different ways. It talks about in John 8 that the Lord sets us free from the slavery of sin. So the first thing Simeon was saying is, I've departed slavery to sin. I'm not gonna be condemned for my sins. I'm never gonna pay for them. He understood the, the, the salvation of the Lord. Paul loved this one, and Peter too. They called life living in a tent, see? And this word is used for someone taking down the tent of their temporary dwelling. And what Simeon said is, I only lived on earth a temporary time. The permanent thing is what I'm looking forward to. I'm only in the temporary tent. Now, I've told you so many times the story of my friend, remember the investment banker that went on a camping trip with Bonnie and with me and all their kids and all of our kids, and he'd never camped before, and he bought this palatial tent, and he brought a mallet. And I, I, when he got that out of his car, I knew we had problems, a big, wooden, long-handled mallet. I said, what? Rick, what are you doing? He said, I don't want the wind to blow my tent away. I said, I said, Rick, I would not 
use the mallet. I said, you can just watch. And I showed him, you just push it in with your foot, the tent stick, you just go like that and leave them out so you can pull them. Nope, he said, I went, I read the package. <laughs> you couldn't see them. They were buried under the sod. I mean, he just buried those things. At 3.30, in the rain, going to the ferry from Prince Edward Island, I went out, pulled mine, wrapped it up, put it in the car, all the kids were warm, motor running, and we were watching with the windshield wipers, Rick. He was straining half hour on the first one. He was trying everything. He almost got a shovel to dig the thing out. Finally, everyone got out of the car. We all got wet. We all tugged on his tent and it collapsed and we just dragged the whole wet mess and threw it in his car. There are two ways people go through life. People that think this is all there is, they're putting the mallet and living like this is all there is and they bury their stakes into this earth. When it comes close to the departure, they're the ones, they aren't ready to go because they're tied here. The Lord says, no, if you're filled with the spirit, you know departure is pulling that tent, get those stakes out, it's temporary and you, and, and this, is, this is such a picture, this word is used for setting sail. And in the ancient world, you had a, a boat just lightly tied, moored, and you just unwrapped it and sailed off. And that's what Simeon said life was like for him. He said, I'm getting ready to go. It's like going on a cruise. And the reason he did that is in the next verse, in verse 30, in Luke 2, he said, for my eyes have seen your salvation and you have prepared before me uh, in the face of all the people, verse 32, a light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. Simeon said, you're the light. You're the light that's lit my path. You're the light of my life. You are the one, the light that I follow. He made Jesus his light. And few metaphors capture Jesus' ministry as well. Light makes stillness come alive. Light settles fear. Light reveals mystery. Life, light enables relationships. Jesus is God in the flesh. And he is the light that broke into our dark worlds and let us know God. And what happens, look at verse 34. Like Simeon, a spirit-filled life makes us praise God. Look what he says in verse 34. Then Simeon's already been praising God. Now he, he blessed them. And spirit-filled living makes us have a life that's a blessing to others. So that's, that's my lesson. Simeon illustrates the invisible spirit-filled life that God offers. But then we come back to this. How long has it been since you invited God to do this in your life? You know, before first service, someone came up to me. I knew they wanted to talk. They were just kind of following me. So I turned around and said, hey, good morning. And they said, I want to talk to one of those people at the end of the service. Which one's a good one? <laughs> I said, you're serious? What are you going to talk to them about? And they told me. And I said, I'll stand next to a good one and go like this. <laughs> I did in first service. I stood there. I thought what his need was. And I stood next to one of the elders. And I whispered to him. I said, I'm pointing to you because... That man over there wants to talk to someone that's good. And I went, boom, he was right on him. And I saw him just before I came in, second service. He said, thank you. Did you know the Lord wants us to ask him to take over? But some people don't know how to do that. At the end of this service, the men and women that come here, stand in the front with their Bibles, the elders and our Titus two women, they would like to help you. But if you don't want to do that, right where you're sitting, you can say, Lord, I'm turning off, pulling the keys out. I'm getting out right now, handing you the keys again. Would you take over my life? Let's all stand for a closing word of prayer. As you stand, I invite you back tonight. We're going to talk about God's will and a whole bunch of other stuff, how to make sure how to have assurance of salvation. Those are some of the best seven or eight questions I've ever gotten on a Sunday night. But Simeon illustrates the spirit-filled life. He's normal, average. And God did something eternal. You want to do something eternal with your life? Pull over. Turn it off. Surrender. 
Keep letting the Lord drive. Every time you realize you're driving, pull over again. Christian life is a series of pullovers and surrenders. Let's bow. Father in heaven, I thank you that at the beginning of this exciting, busy, full, hectic Christmas season, you remind us through Simeon that we can have this very peaceful, confident life following you at your speed, at your rate, on your path, and you lighting the way. And I pray that many of us would choose more and more regularly to let you be in the driver's seat of our life, filling us by your spirit and letting us be spirit-filled and illumined and led and rejoicing and doing what will never end. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.